All right, we welcome you tonight to week number five of Bible 101, Bibliology and Bible Overview, brought to you by the New Covenant College here at the Institute out of the New Testament Baptist Church of Dover, Tennessee. So we come to week number five. Let's look at a quick recap of some of the things that we've discussed thus far. Last week, we concluded that the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture necessitates the perfection and sufficiency of Scripture. And the week before that, we noted that the inspiration of Scripture necessitates its infallibility and inerrancy. And what we've been trying to do this entire class is build a logical, faith-based system of believing bibliology. And we noted that because Scripture is God's complete and final word, then it must be sufficient. And because Scripture originates from the infallible and perfect God, Scripture too must be infallible. And so tonight we want to continue with this same theme and we want to move on to our next faith-based conclusion. What is the logical faith-based conclusion of inspiration and infallibility and sufficiency? I want to submit to you tonight that it is the doctrine of preservation. The doctrine of preservation. And that's what we'll be looking at tonight. Before we do that, though, I want to give you a couple of preliminary definitions of some technical terms that you'll need if you're going to be able to engage in this discussion. I'm going to give you uh, four definitions uh, that you'll need to know so that uh, I'll be able to freely use them and you'll know what I'm talking about. So here they are. The first one is the word autograph. Autograph. And this is not what the baseball player writes on your baseball at the ball game. Uh, an autograph, what that is, is it is an original manuscript. Original manuscript. That is uh, one of the manuscripts that the apostles wrote with their own hand. That is called an autograph. The second definition I want to give you is an opograph. An opograph. This is a copy of an original. The third definition I want to give you is transmission. Transmission. And this is not what goes out in your Chevrolet. Uh, transmission has to do with the copying and recopying of the biblical manuscripts. So transmission is the copying and recopying of the manuscripts. And Anytime you see a capital MSS, if you're reading along in your textbook, which you should all be doing, uh, there by Dr. Hills, you'll probably see that abbreviation, MSS, that's just a manuscript. So it's, transmission is the process of copying and recopying manuscripts. And the last definition I want to give you, though you'll all be familiar with this one, but uh, we still need to make sure that we cover it is translation. Translation. So translation and transmission are different. Transmission is the copying and recopying of the text in the original language. Translation is the copying uh, it's the copying of manuscripts into another language.
So these four words, autograph, apograph, transmission, and translation are words that you will need to know as we go along this evening. All right, let's get into the doctrine of preservation. Now, the things that we've discussed thus far, inspiration and inerrancy and infallibility and perfection and sufficiency, uh, these are characteristics of the form of Scripture as at it was given by God in the autographs. In the autographs. Inspiration, infallibility, inerrancy. We're talking about those original manuscripts and the character and the nature of them. And that's where we've limited our discussion thus far. God gave His inspired, infallible, and sufficient Word. But here's the dilemma. Here's the problem. None of these autographs exist today. There's not one original manuscript that we know of left in existence. So the question that preservation seeks to answer is this. Do the copies that have been passed down through the ages bear the same perfections as the authentic word given by God? So we're saying that the autographs, they were perfect, they're inspired, they're infallible. Well, what about the copies of them? Do they bear the same perfections? Is it possible for them to bear those same perfections as that authentic word as it was given by God? That's what we're asking when we talk about the doctrine of preservation. I want to say to you that there's two primary views on preservation. Now, this is an oversimplification. I'll admit that freely. Uh, because within these two views, there's a good deal of variety. But basically, if you want to be very general and broad, which we do because we don't have much time in this class, um, we, we know that there are two views of preservation. Uh, the first, we're going to call it the modern view. The modern view of preservation. And this view uh, could be also labeled substantial or quasi-preservation. So substantial or quasi-preservation. Now, as far as the substantial goes, uh, some, say, some say that only the thoughts or ideas or the doctrines of Scripture have been preserved not the actual word. So that's substantial preservation. It's, it's not the specific words and, and numbers and uh, letters, but it, it, it's just the substance of the text. What the text is communicating, that's the, the message that has been preserved. Uh, they say that God preserved His word so that no essential doctrine was lost, but there's no special promise of preservation on the individual words of the Bible. That's, that's substantial preservation. Uh, then we uh, also have what we're calling in this class quasi-preservation. And I understand that uh, uh, perhaps those who hold to a more modern view of pr preservation would uh, not particularly care to call their view quasi-preservation, but I do believe it's fitting when we look at what they're actually saying about it. Now, more conservative Christians would reject substantial preservation. Okay, They, they would. That's a very liberal view of preservation, to say that only the, the teachings of the Bible are preserved. However, what's becoming very prevalent in our day is this idea of quasi-preservation. This is a, a view that says that uh, the words of God have been preserved, so that the, the specific letters and words of God have been preserved. We just don't know where they are. <laughs> uh, they could be in the text. They could be in the footnote. They could be in a, a, a critical notation. Uh, they could be still buried in the sand over in Egypt waiting to be discovered. So th they would say that, yes, God has preserved His word, but we don't know where it is. And this is a, a very common view in contemporary times. And uh, those who hold to this view use the manuscript evidence to try to determine the supposed original reading. 
right? Because they say, well, we know that it's there somewhere. We just don't know where. And so we need to examine the evidence and we need to uh, document the manuscripts and search for manuscripts. And as manuscripts are discovered, we need to take them into view. And we need to look at all the massive manuscripts we have and try to determine what the original reading was or is. And this view is almost exclusively based on the manuscript evidence. Now, we... Uh, we don't totally negate or overlook manuscript evidence. I think it's very important, uh, of course, it's very important to look at the manuscript evidence. However, when you don't believe that we know where the Word of God is, when it's somewhere but we don't know where, you're bound to endlessly search through and look for that manuscript evidence. And they specifically value the age of a manuscript. Um, if there's an older manuscript, even if it disagrees with the reading that is found in the majority of other manuscripts, they will prefer that manuscript on the basis of its antiquity. One of the principles of the modern view of quasi-preservation is older means better. Older means better. You'll hear that all the time. Well, the older and better manuscripts say this. Even though a majority of manuscripts might have one particular reading, the older ones say this. And um, perhaps not tonight, but we, we will get into why that is so uh, such a flawed view, uh, this older means better. And they come to this principle of the valuing the antiquity of a manuscript because they assume the corruption of the Word of God, not its preservation. So they're coming at it from the back door, assuming the corruption, not the preservation. And this is a fundamentally flawed and naturalistic view of the Bible. That's, that's the root of the issue. That they view the transmission of the Bible as they would any other ancient literary work. Uh, there, if there is no promise that God has sovereignly preserved His precise word, word, then we're left to view the transmission of the Scriptures uh, like we would any other ancient literary work. We would have to essentially come to understand our view of the text of Scripture the same way we would uh, Caesar's Gaelic Wars, for instance, another older ancient piece of literature. And we would have to apply the same rules of textual criticism as we would to anything else to the Word of God. And as we will see shortly, this principle of con assuming corruption, not preservation, contradicts the logic of faith and the explicit claims that God makes about His own Word. So uh, that is the, the more modern view of preservation. Yes, the Word of God has been preserved. Uh, God's God's preserved it. He's put His seal upon it. It's somewhere, but we don't know where. I've, I've heard scholars say of the um, Nestle Allen critical text, which has uh, the text and then it has the variants in the footnotes, and they will hold that document and they'll say, we believe that all of God's preserved Word is here. We just don't know if it's in the text or in the footnotes. So they don't, they don't quite know yet. And hopefully, um, when this view first came out, when it first started gaining popularity, the, the idea was that uh, now that we were in the age of the printing press and that uh, we were advancing, that the work of textual criticism would be soon done and we would very quickly know uh, when it, uh, we would have that final dependable Word of God. Uh, when Benjamin Warfield, for instance, he was one of the early pioneers of this view. And, and by the way, let me just say Benjamin Warfield was a tremendous theologian. And I don't believe Benjamin Warfield would have ever anticipated what would have come out of modern textual criticism. Uh, but now here we are, 150, 200 years later, and we're not anywhere closer to be having any kind of certainty on the text if we are in that modern uh, camp. Uh, because... Uh, something could be discovered tomorrow that could drastically change our view of the canon of Scripture and the text of Scripture if we're solely dependent upon manuscript evidence and on top of that, solely dependent upon older manuscript evidence. So that's the modern view. Uh, now I want to give you 
<laughs> the historic view, historic view. And um, there's no hard bias intended in these terms. Uh, it's just that we call it the modern view because it has only recently become popular and articulated in, in recent days, whereas the historic view of preservation has been articulated and we can find it uh, spoken of by the people of God for a longer period of time. Uh, what does this historic view teach? This historic view teaches what we are calling providential preservation. Providential preservation. Providential preservation asserts that God's Word has been preserved and manifested to God's people in every age. And that's what, that's what it's asserting. That God's Word has been preserved, the words of God, not just the thoughts or the doctrines, but the words of God, and has been manifested to God's people in every age age. An authentic copy of God's Word has always existed, and God's people have always possessed a preserved copy of the original text. Now, this view was best articulated um, in that old London Baptist Confession of 1689, which we've referenced many times already in this class. They have an excellent chapter, chapter number one, on the doctrine of Scripture is just absolutely excellent. And one of the most striking things that they say in this chapter is in paragraph 8, and I want to read it for you, and we'll, we'll use that as a springboard because they really sum up, the framers of the confession really sum up this view of providential preservation. They say this, chapter 1, paragraph 8, The Old Testament in Hebrew, which was the native language of the people of God of old, and the New Testament in Greek, which at the time of, of the writing of it, was most generally known to the nations, being immediately inspired by God, that's an important uh, phrase, immediately inspired by God, and, watch this, by His singular care and providence, kept pure in all ages, are therefore authentic, so as in all controversies of religion, the church is finally to appeal to them. So there's three things that they bring out that the view of providential preservation teaches. There's three things, and we'll spend the remainder of our lesson tonight looking at those three things. The first point is this. Providential preservation follows the logic of faith and connects inspiration with preservation. It follows the logic of faith that connects inspiration with preservation. It connects how God gave the Bible with how God has kept the Bible. Secondly, providential preservation applies inspiration and preservation to the words in the texts of the Old Testament and the New Testament, not simply to the teachings or doctrines. And thirdly, Providential preservation affirms that God's people have uh, had this preserved word to appeal to as their final authority in every age. So those are the three major tenets of providential preservation, and we're going to prove them tonight from the Scriptures. So if you would, turn to that very familiar portion of Scripture, 2 Timothy 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, and verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16. So our first point of providential preservation um, is that inspiration presupposes preservation. Inspiration presupposes preservation. Preservation is the logical, faith-based conclusion of inspiration. Look at what Paul says, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now what scripture is Paul talking about when he says all scripture? 
Now, in the context, he's speaking of the entirety of the Old Testament, right? Paul obviously didn't have a completed New Testament when he was writing this, though uh, the principle would apply to the New Testament because the New Testament equates itself with the Scriptures of the Old Testament. So Paul's talking about all Scripture. But more, more than that, what kind of Scripture is he talking about? Well, he says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So Paul is talking about inspired Scripture. And he says that it is this inspired Scripture, watch, that is profitable. Not will be profitable, not was profitable, but it is profitable. Well, Paul must have been talking about something that he possessed. Something that he had. Something he could hold up and say, this is the inspired word of God, and this is profitable. Ah, but wait a minute. I thought that only the originals were immediately inspired by God. And there's no way Paul could have had any original manuscripts of the Old Testament here in the first century when he was writing this book to Timothy. Huh. So how can Paul claim to have God's inspired word? Well, I'd say you're right. Only the original autographs were immediately inspired. But that didn't create any problems for Paul because Paul believed in the providential preservation of those inspired manuscripts. I gave this illustration a couple weeks ago when I wrote the word Kyrios, and we transmitted and we translated. Let me give it to you again. If God immediately inspires His apostles to write something, that is, He uses uh, no means whatsoever. He just moves them with the power of the Holy Ghost to write exactly what He wants them to write, and He immediately inspires them to write the Greek word, Kyrios. Is this word immediately inspired? Yes, it's inspired, it's infallible, it's sufficient, so on and so forth. Well, what if somebody comes along after, let's say he comes along 100, 200 years later, and he copies it, transmits it. So he's going from autograph to apograph, and he does this. He writes it just like this. Kyrios. Well, was this immediately inspired? No, not at all. Uh, the one who was doing this, he did not write as he was moved by the Holy Ghost. It was not immediately inspired. He could have made an error, but did he? That's the question. Did he? And the answer is no. Exactly the same. And here's another one for you. Uh, Paul, though... Uh, proficient in Hebrew was also proficient in Greek. We know that our Lord and His apostles had Greek manuscripts of the Old Testament. So what if Paul had have been using an Old Testament manuscript that had been translated into Greek? You'd say, well, surely that uh, couldn't be uh, part of the preserved Word of God because that's going from another language. And we all know that there's no perfect translation from one language to another. Well, you're right. There's no ideally perfect but there is a practical perfect translation. See, if we went from Kyrios, transmitted to Kyrios, and then translated to L-O-R-D, Lord, which is what that word means in the Greek, what have we done? We've just perfectly translated the word from Kyrios in Greek to Lord in English. And we could have done it in Hebrew, Adonai, right? So we have an immediately inspired original, but we have immediately inspired. Not immediately. That's a, that's a big distinction we need to make. Immediately inspired copies and translations. They are only inspired in so much as the original was inspired, in so much as they agree with the original. And you'll hear guys in the... Uh, that hold to the modern view of preservation, you'll hear them say things like, well, we believe that a translation is uh, perfect and authoritative so long as it maintains the original. 
Well, if you don't believe you have an identifiable original, a statement like that doesn't add up to a hill of beans. You have to be able to say, we have the original and we know what the original says in order for a statement like that to make sense. So, in this case, we have the original, we can see the original, and because we can see the original, we know it's inspired, and therefore a perfect translation, or a perfect transmission, a perfect translation, is immediately inspired. Well, today, we don't have the original. We don't have the original. But we've received the promise of preservation, and we believe that God has kept pure the transmission in every age. Now, has He uh, allowed corruptions to creep into the text? Yes, He has. And there are uh, corruptions and there are corrupt manuscripts. But He has preserved His Word and manifested that perfect Word to His church in every age so that He can sift through corruptions organically. The Holy Spirit sifts through corruptions organically by witnessing to the true Word of God to His people. And so that's what Paul's saying here in 2 Timothy 3 in verse 16. He's saying all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's still profitable today because we still have the originals today perfectly preserved in copies and translations. Paul understood that it would be absolutely illogical for God to inspire His Word and then subsequently allow it to pass away. What good would it have been for God to have spoken His Word and then allowed it to pass away? There would have been no point in delivering His Word. So point number one is that inspiration presupposes preservation. Point number two, the words of God are preserved. Not just the thoughts, not just the teachings, but the words. Now, perhaps what Paul meant in 2 Timothy was that it wasn't the text of Scripture that was inspired and preserved, but just the thoughts and the ideas. Well, that too makes no sense. Paul says that the Scripture is inspired and that Scripture is profitable for doctrine. Brethren, where is our doctrine formulated? Is not our doctrine formulated from the words of God? It's, it's from the words that we develop doctrine. We systematize what God has said in His words to formulate doctrine and teaching. We live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Paul didn't say all doctrines are given by the inspiration of God and doctrine is profitable for doctrine. No, that's not what he said at all. Doctrine is the conclusion of the words that have been preserved. Paul believed he possessed an inspired and preserved text that was the basis for sound doctrine. If it's a corrupt text, if Paul can't be sure about the text, if Paul thought in the first century uh, that, well, I don't really know if I have the perfect word of God or not, then how could Paul emphatically say that this word is profitable for sound doctrine. He couldn't have, right. but he believed that the Word of God had been preserved and kept pure. And we find that Jesus and Paul agreed on this matter of inspiration. Turn to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. And we'll look at there at the words of our Lord. It's a classic text when we look at the doctrine of preservation. Look at verse 18. Matthew chapter number 5 and verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, when Jesus says it shall no, in no wise pass from the law, similar to Paul talking about the Old Testament, this word law is what we call in the English grammar a synecdoche. It's when you use a part of something to refer to the whole of something. It's when you use a part of something to refer to the whole of something. Remember when Paul was on the ship and uh, uh, he talked about there were 
this many souls on the ship and all the souls were saved. Well, he doesn't mean that uh, it was just the immaterial of the, of the men on the ship that were saved, but he's using that soul, part of them, to refer to the whole man. Well, it's the same thing here. When Jesus says, one jot of the law shall in no wise pass away, that can be applied to all of the words of God. And he says, till heaven and earth pass. Well, when is that? That's forever, friend. That's as long as this world exists. We, we learned, I think it was last week, it might have been the week before, in Psalm 119 in verse 89, the Bible says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And Jesus takes that heavenly promise and applies it to planet earth when he says, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. This means that there was never a time in which the Word of God was not perfectly preserved upon the earth. We need to receive the promise of Christ here about His Word the same way we would about His church. He said that upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. What does that mean? That means there has never been a time upon the earth from our Lord's first coming till His second when His church did not exist. So too it is with His Word. There's never been a time, never will be a time, when God's perfectly preserved Word will not exist on this earth. This is what our particular Baptist forefathers confessed in the confession when they said that the Word of God has been kept pure in all ages. Kept pure in all ages. Now, Jesus here gets very specific. He says, one jot or one tittle. Now, a jot is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It looks like a, a hyphen or an or a apostrophe, excuse me, in the English language. It's a very small letter. And a tittle is even smaller. A tittle is a mark that differentiates one letter from another. Uh, if I wrote this, okay, what letters are those? Well, if I put a little tittle on there, now you know that this is a T and this is an L. So it's a little marking that differentiates one letter from another. Do the same thing. Looks like two O's. Now it's a Q. It's a tittle. What was Jesus doing? He was affirming the stability of preserved Scripture on the smallest scale possible. See, it's not just the big picture that's preserved. Yes, God did inspire His Word in the plenary, the thoughts, the doctrines, the teachings, but He also inspired it and preserved it verbally. Verbally. Jesus and Paul wanted us to understand that God did not merely preserve thoughts and ideas, but He preserved His words. So that's point number two, that the words of God have been preserved. Point number three, the church has always possessed this Word. They've always possessed His Word. Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ have always had God's perfect Word to appeal to. See, now many who hold to a different view of preservation than the one we've been setting forth will still agree with points 1 and 2. They'll still agree that God has preserved what He has inspired and that He has inspired and preserved individual words. So that's a common uh, point of agreement amongst Christians. However, point number three, that believers in every age have had this word to appeal to and have had, had access to this word and have been able to distinguish God's word from not God's word. Well, that's a point of contention. But it is one of the most crucial aspects to believing bibliology and providential preservation. Not only has God preserved His Word and kept it pure, but He has also authenticated that Word in the hearts of His people through the illuminating grace of the Holy Spirit in every age. He's preserved it, He's kept it pure, and He's authenticated His Word to His people in every age. Now, it's something we need to understand because this is a rational conclusion of the logic of faith. What good would it have done for God to perfectly preserve His Word only to keep it hidden for thousands of years? What good would it have done? 
Furthermore, if there was ever a time in which the inspired Word of God was lost or passed away, we would have no authority from which to reconstruct an original. The divine word was given one time. He spoke it one time, and he never spoke it again. He never re-inspired his word. But if you believe that the word of God fell away at any point in time, you'll come to one or two conclusions. Either you will believe that we do not have the perfect, inspired, infallible word of God today. Some Christians take that view. We have something that's pretty good, or we have it, but we don't know where it is, or whatever. Or you'll come to the conclusion, which is perhaps most more detrimental, that the Word of God was corrupted and passed away for a season, and then God, in whatever year, <laughs> re-inspired it. Well, neither one of those views are biblical. No, God has maintained the purity of His Word throughout every age. I remember uh, listening to a debate between two brothers who held to these two different views of preservation. And the one who held to the modern view asked the one who held to the providential view of preservation. He said, uh, is there any evidence that could be discovered? Is there any manuscript that could be discovered that would change your position on the text? And they were, I think they were debating one of the controversial uh, textual variants, and his answer was, well, my view of the text is not exclusively based on manuscript evidence, but I first receive the promise that God has providentially preserved His Word, and that is how we need to interpret the evidence. We don't want to interpret, just like we wouldn't want to do it with the account of creation. We don't look and see what the scientists are saying about creation and evolution and Darwinism and then accept that and then go to the Scriptures and make the promises of Scripture fit with scientific evidence. So too we don't take physical manuscript evidence and, and hold that as our final authority and then make the promises of the Word of God fit with the evidence. No, it's the other way around. We receive the providence or the, the promises and that's how we understand the evidence. So Paul claimed that he could appeal to the inspired Word of God for sound doctrine. Why? Because he believed that the Word of God had been manifested to him and all other Christians before him and all Christians after him could make that same claim. I can say today that I have the Word of God and that it's profitable for doctrine. And that is what the framers of the confession said when they, they said that by his singular care and providence he's kept it pure in all ages and it's authentic. So as in all controversies of religion, the church is finally to appeal to them the inspired texts of the Old and New Testament. Last, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew 28, as we close this evening. And I want you to see our Lord's presupposition that His people would always have His Word. Look, what our, look at what our Lord said in Matthew 28. That very familiar passage of the Great Commission. Verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now watch this, what, what, what our Lord says in verse 20. He says, teaching them, who's that? That's the discipled and baptized nations. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. In the Great Commission, Jesus commands His church to disciple the nations, and then after that, to teach them all things, to observe all things whatsoever He's commanded. And this is to be our work from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. Well, what is the Word of God? What are the things Jesus has commanded? Uh, is it just those things 
that he taught his disciples in his three and a half year ministry? Well, it certainly includes that. But I don't think we can limit it at that. Jesus is the Logos of God. He is the living Word. It, Jesus Christ, you understand, this is all the words of Jesus Christ. This is all the commandments of Jesus Christ that He has given to His people. And we're to command all people to obey all of this. But how can the church obey this command in the Great Commission to teach disciples all of the Word of Jesus Christ if they don't have all of the word of Jesus Christ. Well, you say after 1611, we were able to obey the Great Commission because now we finally had the word of God. No, friend. The church in every age has been able to obey this command because in every age, they've had the word of God. Long before the Bible ever made it into the English language, there was a people somewhere speaking whatever language they spoke, be it Greek, be it Latin, be it Old English, French, Anglo-Saxon, that had the Word of God in their tongue and were able to carry out the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. If there was ever a time when the words of Christ passed away, the great commission could no longer be fulfilled. But Jesus said Himself, Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not Amen. pass away. So therefore, we affirm providential preservation. God has inspired His Word. He has kept that Word pure in all ages. And He has manifested that Word to His people so that they have the inspired, infallible, sufficient Word of God as their final authority in every age. It's a seamless chain from first immediately giving His Word by the inspiration of God all the way up to today. It's a seamless, unbroken chain of preservation. And in the coming weeks, we will examine the basis and the implications of providential preservation of the Word of God. Thank you and God bless you.